Hello, I'm Andy Sophia Fontaine, editor at Eisen Review. I'm here at Kvaleiravat, and it's a beautiful autumn day, which is Iceland's shortest season. One of the oldest jokes that you will hear if you ever visit Iceland is, what do you do if you get lost in an Icelandic forest? The answer is, stand up. This might have been the case, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago. That's just how old this joke is. But as you can see, um, if you go to some parts of the country anyway, the trees are significantly taller. And it's really nice to be able to enjoy an autumn day such as this because autumn is a very, very, very short season in Iceland. Very short. Sometimes we don't even get it at all. Sometimes we go straight to winter. So polar bears. Polar bears are not native to Iceland, but they do show up here from time to time. What happens when they do? We'll find out on this episode of Iceland News Review. <laughs> mentioned, polar bears are not native to Iceland, and you're not likely to see them. But the Westfjords in northwest Iceland is very close to Greenland, and so when there is a polar bear landing, which happens from time to time, it's usually there in the northwest. Such a case happened just last week when a woman, an 83-year-old Icelandic woman, Austhilde Gunnarsdóttir, um, she was visiting her summer cabin in Hövdestrand, which is in the Westfjords, and just going about her business, you know, she had to go out to a barn to turn on the electricity for the cabin. And she was going back to put on her boots. When she looked out the window, she said that she saw something white. And her first thought, is that a horse? Or maybe it's a fox, perhaps? And she took a closer look and realized she was looking at a polar bear, but she didn't believe it at first. Nonetheless, she tried to call emergency services, which is 112 but the phone reception was really poor where she was. And so she used Starlink to contact her daughter who in turn called emergency services about this bear. And what I thought was really interesting about this story was her reaction to this, her emotional reaction to this um, was she wasn't scared, she said, um, because the polar bear wasn't especially big. In fact, in photos that were shown, the polar bear itself was about the size of a large German shepherd you know, barely not even a cub anymore. And she thought that the bear was cute. Well, the uh, rescue boat and the helicopter and the authorities who arrived did not find the bear very cute. And they did what they normally do, what they always do, in fact, when a polar bear lands in this country and they killed it. Um, so this is a very controversial practice, the killing of polar bears, and has been for a long time. In fact, some years ago, um, we had a mayor of Reykjavik, Jón Gnar, comedian and writer Jón Gnar, and he had advocated that we instead like, shoot it with a tranquilizer dart and put these bears in the Reykjavik Zoo instead. The reason why we, they're killed, um, that I've been told anyway, I'm still digging, trying to get more, more information on this, is that authorities in Kalalit Nunat, or Greenland, um, we don't want to accept these bears because they're concerned that these bears may bring back parasites or diseases that are not native to the environment that they come from and endanger the native population of polar bears there. Um, like there is a question of whether or not they could be tranquilized and then put into quarantine perhaps and then tested to be sure that they're absolutely clean and then if so fly them back there. But that's a whole other subject. For now, this is what they do. Polar bear lands here and it's killed and then usually taken in for studies of some kind. And that's just the reality. One of the things that I love about living in Europe is that it's very common for people to just move to other countries. As someone who's originally from the United States, it's such a huge landmass that even if you move thousands of kilometers away, <laughs> you're still in the same country. At Iceland, though, of course, is an island nation, but what kind of countries would Icelanders want to live in if they were moving to another country in Europe? Interestingly enough, um, one-fifth, the largest proportion of Icelanders in a recent poll said that they would choose Denmark, the former colonial power. Spain came in second place with one in 10 Icelanders saying that they would move there. Um, following this is Norway, Italy, the United States, and Sweden, rounding out the top six. Now this, of course, varies by age. Like people over the age of 60 and between 30 and 40 years of age 
said they're most excited about moving to Denmark. Spain is most popular amongst people who are over 50. And those under 30 felt more excited about moving to Norway and Sweden instead. Now, this is a really common practice, though, of like Icelanders living abroad. So common, in fact, that 13% of Icelanders actually live abroad, which I just learned recently. Um, nearly one quarter of them do live in Denmark, um, with Norway and Sweden being the second and third choice, respectively, followed by the US and the UK. And I don't know, I think this is kind of interesting that because Again, as an American, when I think about some other countries I might move to, I don't, the first country that comes to mind is not like the former colonial power, but I don't know, maybe it was recent enough and there's a friendly enough relationship between Iceland and Denmark, like they didn't have a violent revolution to get their independence. So maybe sentiments are different. Just yesterday, we received a statement at our, at our news desk um, about a running enthusiast who's trying to break the world record for the shortest time running the entirety of the Ring Road. And he's doing this for a good cause. His name is Sebastian Key. And the Ring Road stretches some 1,322 kilometers or 820 miles. That's quite a long distance to travel, <laughs> on foot especially. But he's doing this in the hopes of raising money for the charity Children with Cancer UK. Why this charity in particular? Well, the inspiration, which I thought was very touching, comes close to, comes close to home. Namely, through his sister Libby. When he was five years old, his sister Libby, who was 11 months, I believe, was diagnosed with a tumor in her brain. And fortunately, she survived this, but this instilled in him this uh, desire to support the treatment of cancer in children. And so he's trying to raise money through this effort for this charity in trying to break this world record. In case you were curious, the previous record was made in 2015 by one David Chong, who had covered the Ring Road in 27 days. Now, yesterday, the day before this recording, I had spoken to one of the organizers who had said that Sebastian is just now in Hup, which is in southeast Iceland, heading on his way to Reykjavik. And so it looks like they're about to break the record, which is fantastic. And in the description below, I've linked to Sebastian's Instagram page so you can follow his progress. And I have linked to the, uh, the charity fundraiser so that if you feel so inclined and you have the ability you can make a donation yourself to Children with Cancer UK. So for our next story here, I'm going to get a little controversial. I hope I don't make too many people angry, but we're going to be talking about cars and cyclists. And if you've ever visited Reykjavik, um, you'll probably notice really quickly just how many cars there are. Uh, it's a very car heavy sort of town. And yes, there is mass transit, of course, but the emphasis is still very much on cars. On cycling, it's even, there's even less emphasis. And there's an Icelander named Bray Gunnlaugsson, who had spent time living in Denmark and Germany, which are far more bicycle friendly. And coming back to Iceland, um, the contrast has inspired in him a little project whereby he has made, where he makes videos and regularly posts videos of drivers who, uh, let's just say, are less than courteous in sharing transportation space with him. By Icelandic law, cyclists are allowed to be on the same road with drivers, and the drivers must give one and a half meters of space. Cyclists can even ride on the sidewalk if there's no bike lanes available. But for whatever reason, um, drivers can be, yeah, they can be a little bit aggressive, a little bit of, uh, territorial <laughs> with their personal space when it comes to sharing the road with cyclists. But so if you do come to Iceland with a bicycle and you want to be cycling around downtown, just maybe bear that in mind, like keep your eyes open. One of the major complaints that a lot of cyclists have 
in Reykjavik is that even where there are bark even where there are bike lanes, um, car drivers are fond of parking directly on these bike lanes to like jump in to make a quick trip into a store or something like that. And yeah, that's illegal. You're not supposed to do that. Um, I don't know. It's a really interesting project that he, he's engaging in to try to raise awareness, not just shame drivers or scold them necessarily, but just, you know, to educate people that like, you know, not everyone who's on the road is in a car. Some people are cycling and we need to share this transportation space together, especially if, as has been the policy of the city of Reykjavik, we want to have alternative transportation available for everybody. See, look, I told you, a proper forest. Trees are, are much taller than my head. Anyways, the Northern Lights. This is another really nice aspect of autumn in Iceland is we're officially entering Northern Light season. And what's really nice about this is that if you visit the homepage of the Icelandic Met Office, you can see uh, Northern Lights activity on any particular hour of the day or night, and you compare that to the cloud cover, you can tell where the northern lights are out. But the sun, like the earth, also goes through cycles. And the good news is, is that we are now entering a time of increased northern lights activity. Uh, Saivar Helgi Bryason, who's a, a science educator, mostly about astronomy, um, was recently talking to reporters about this, and in his estimation, we are now entering a solar maximum. And the peak years are gonna be 2026, 27, 28, and 29, but we're entering a solar maximum right now, which means increased Northern Lights activity. Now, I live in downtown Reykjavik, and I'm very, very lucky if I'm able to see the Northern Lights from where I live in the center of downtown. The best way to see the Northern Lights is, of course, to get away from urban light pollution. And if you choose to do that, you can select the sponsor for today's episode, Blue Car Rental, who I've linked to in the description. It's a really singular experience. I mean, I do know some Icelanders that are a bit cynical about the Northern Lights, but most of them are not. In fact, when the Northern Lights appear, <laughs> one really good way to tell if you have a lot of Icelandic friends on social media is they'll start posting about it. Um, whether they're posting photos that they took with their phones on a particularly good time or just, you know, making a Facebook status or a tweet saying that the Northern Lights are out. So that's another way to tell. But if you don't have a ton of Icelandic friends on social media, again, veder.is, V-E-D-U-R dot I-S, um, is a great way to know when the activity is good. Most Northern Lights tours will offer refunds if you head out with them and you don't see any Northern Lights, so you can keep trying. But as I said, you can also take matters in your own hands, rent a car from Blue Car Rental, and head out to wherever you wanna go and experience this incredible sensation for yourself. The continuing drama of wind farms in Iceland continues. Um, the latest wrinkle that has come up is related to the white-tailed eagle, which is a protected species here in Iceland. There's only 90 mating pairs of these eagles left in Iceland, which is the most that there's been since conservation efforts began in 1914. So they're, you know, struggling, definitely struggling. Um, well, it turns out that the wind farms, at least where they're proposing putting them up, could pose a risk to them. The Environmental Agency of Iceland and the Icelandic Institute of Natural History have warned a company called Q Air or Quair, I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but it's spelled Q-A-I-R, Iceland. Um, they've warned them that where they're planning to put up the wind farm in Solheimar in South Iceland um, could have a greater impact on this white eagle population than they have estimated. And so they're calling for like another environmental assessment to be done to find a better location for them. When I've looked into this, I found that uh, in some cases, um, at some wind farms, they put up like sirens of a sort that only birds can hear to keep them away from a, an area. But you know, wind turbines are very tall. So I don't know all the specifics. I don't know the exact science behind it, 
but a lot of advocates have been calling for greater study done into environmental impacts of these wind farms. They believe that this project is being rushed, um, whereas proponent, proponents of the wind farm believe that where they're planning to put these turbines up poses absolutely no risk to anybody. Iceland has a lot of wind and we should be taking advantage of that. Lastly, on Iceland News Review, U.S. presidential elections. Now, you might be tired of hearing about this, but I thought that this was pretty interesting. There is a recent poll where Icelanders would ask who they would vote for if they could vote in the U.S. presidential elections, whether they would vote for Vice President Kamala Harris or former President Donald Trump. Um, the results will not surprise you. 91% of Icelanders said they would vote for Harris. Only 9% said they would vote for Trump. But there were some interesting differences when broken down by demographics. Men were more likely than women to say that they would vote for Trump at 15% and 4% respectively. Those aged 50 to 59 were the most likely to pick Harris, 97%. Whereas, and this was the weirdest part of all to me, those aged 40 to 49 and those aged 18 to 39 were the highest level of age groups who said they would vote for Trump at 15% and 12% respectively. I would think that younger people would not be, I don't know, really uh, smitten with the idea of, of Trump as president of the United States, but that's how it is. In terms of political parties, the Social Democrats and the Left Greens had unanimous support for Harris as president. And by unanimous, I mean 100% of those who say they vote for the Social Democrats and the Left Greens saying that they would vote for Harris. Um, Trump's support also stayed at 4% or lower amongst the Progressive Party, the Socialist Party, the Pirate Party, and the Reform Party. The highest levels of support for Donald Trump amongst those who said they were voting for any particular political party in Iceland, which I'll get to later, were voters for the People's Party, the Independence Party, and the Center Party. Uh, these are all right-wing parties, unsurprisingly, and 16%, 21%, and 28% of those voters, respectively, said they would vote for Trump if they could. But the largest share of support for Trump came from those who said that they did not plan on voting in Iceland's elections or who said they would submit a blank ballot. 70, 70% of those said they would vote for Trump. Now, when I say not vote or submit a blank ballot, those are also options that people have in parliamentary elections. You can, sure, not show up, or you can show up and just submit a blank ballot as a form of protest. That's all I have for you today here on Iceland News Review. Um, sorry I wasn't around last week. I was very sick. As you can hear, I'm still trying to get over it. But I'll see you again next week, barring uh, health issues. Uh, thanks for joining us. Be good to each other. <laughs>